So the message for tonight is this baby changes everything. This baby changes everything. Uh, those of us who are parents know babies change everything. And the first baby totally turns the house upside down. You know that? Uh, the happiest baby, baby center survey recently uh, surveyed over a thousand parents with babies under six months old. And here were some of the findings. After becoming parents, 86% reported an increase in love, in their capacity for love, in the range of their love. They did things they never thought they'd do. They were doing these for the baby. It's the greatest response that was surveyed of all these new parents. 71% of parents reported an increase in their joy. And interestingly, the rate of joy went up with each of the first month six. And then so each month, the joy kept growing. And then also 70% of parents experienced more awe. Many of them reported they suddenly were thinking about God when, when this child was born. They realized that there was a power at work far, far greater than they knew or had ever encompassed in their own minds. So here's some other things about having a baby uh, that a lot of people report. It's no longer about you. Your life is no longer about you. The household is no longer about you. The house itself is no longer about you. Your priorities change, maybe even your interests. Your heart grows and keeps growing beyond what you would have ever imagined possible through this baby coming. Your house does change. You know, it's always interesting to, to be around and kind of visit parents, expecting parents who are expecting their first child. They start trying to get the house ready, maybe trying to set up a room, trying to set up this or that. And then suddenly the baby comes and they realize, oh, we didn't do this right. We need to make some adjustments. Reality hits with baby number one. Uh, and then the changes just keep coming. You know, the baby doesn't stop growing. Did you know that? They don't stay little bitty infants. They grow. And, and suddenly you realize they're not going to be immobile very long. And then we go into the stage of child-proofing the house for the crawler and for the climber and for the walker and for the runner and then for the terrible threes and then the school kid. And then you get to preteens and teenagers. And even if you're staying in the same house, suddenly the house doesn't look at all like it looked before the baby came and the baby grew up into a teenager. The priorities, the, the, the arrangements, what the house looks like is very different in most families. But let me pause and just say in a few minutes we're going to be singing one of the most famous Christmas carols of all, in many ways the theologically richest of the Christmas carols. Hark, the herald angels sing. That hymn, that carol, was written by Charles Wesley in 1739. That was not much more than a year after Charles Wesley's conversion to Christ. His coming to know Jesus personally. Did you know that? He wrote that hymn just a little more than a year after he was born again in Jesus Christ. Now, let me be clear. Charles Wesley was not an atheist. He was not a person of another religion. He was not a nominal Christian who lived a wild or God-forgetting life. Charles Wesley grew up in church all the time. He was the son of a pastor. And uh, he was the younger brother of another pastor's kid, his brother, older brother, John Wesley. But Charles, like John, was not only an avid church member, but also became a clergyman as a young man. They both had been educated at Christ College at Oxford University. And they had helped start a group that was really focused on trying to be more intense about their Christian disciplines that became derisively referred to as the Methodist. And they went ahead and took on that name in the late 1720s there at Oxford as they became 
uh, you know, burgeoning new clergy leaders. After their graduation, after their ordination, they continued. Charles, along with what? With John Wesley, continued to affirm all the classic Christian creeds. They knew what to say. They knew about Jesus being the Son of God. They, they proclaimed all of that. They professed belief in that. Charles and John Wesley knew the scriptures and could quote massive portions of it far better than, let's be honest, probably most of you can. I mean, these guys were intense about their Christian religion, and they even went on to serve as missionaries with Oglethorpe, you know, serving in connection with the establishment of the colony called Georgia in the New World. They were missionaries, and not really fruitful missionaries, and that was kind of part of what got them thinking further. Uh, they both got sick. They were not very effective in their mission work of bringing people to Christ. And so back in England, in the spring of 1738, Charles Wesley, along with John, they, they were each struggling with the same spiritual dilemma. Charles Wesley knew, just like John did, that he was not born again. Are, are you born again? Have you been born anew? Are you on fire in the Holy Spirit where the Lord Jesus leads and transforms your life? Well, well, they knew they were not born again. They knew the scripture well enough to understand this and they knew from their lives. Raised in the church and now serving the church, Charles Wesley was not assured of his salvation precisely because he knew he had never been converted to Christ in a living fire of the Spirit relationship that changed him from the inside out. With that spiritual struggle ongoing and trying to recover from some ongoing medical and physical challenges that he had, illnesses he had, returning from his mission work in Georgia, Charles Wesley in May of 1738 moved into the home of a Moravian believer named John Bray. Just across from Aldersgate in London. In his journal, Charles Wesley writes about Bray, God sent Mr. Bray to me, a poor, ignorant mechanic who knows nothing but Christ, yet knowing him, knows and discerns everything. Charles Wesley also testifies that after a worship service early that month at which communion was served, Charles writes, received the sacrament, but not Christ. On May 16th, a friend, William Holland, who was also seeking to truly know Jesus personally, uh, had Charles Wesley read from Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians about justification by faith alone and about the born again freedom that comes to all who truly are in faith by the Holy Spirit through Christ alone. And somehow that night on the 16th of May, God moved William Holland to salvation. Charles wrote later the next day, Holland was clearly moved to faith and got it. I don't get it. Charles Wesley continued praying the next several days, seeking intensely to know Christ and to hear from Christ. And then he records about his own conversion, which happened on Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, May 21st, 1738. Charles prayed, quoting scripture, I mean, he knew the scripture, prayed, quoting scripture, in which Christ made promises to come to all who call on his name. And for instance, he heavily quoted and repeated and prayed through John 14, verse 23. Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we, my father and I, will come to him and make our home with him. After praying, Charles was drifting off to sleep when Mrs. Musgrave, who was serving as his nurse, helping him return to health, he 
kept getting these flashes of weakness that came back to him. She walked into the room there in the Bray house and seemingly out of nowhere quoted from scripture and said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and believe and you shall be healed of your infirmities. This came out of the blue. <laughs> Where did this come from? Charles was struck to the heart and said, oh Christ, that you would speak to me like this. And then all of a sudden the spirit spoke to Charles and he knew <laughs> that was Jesus <laughs> talking to him. And he received and believed. He had a newfound sense of peace with God through Christ from that Pentecost night onward. And he writes about it in the, in the latter part of his May 1738 journal entries. He also describes a new and profound awareness of his great weakness apart from Jesus. Do you know that weakness? Do you know his strength? his living grace and power for you. As we come to celebrate Jesus is coming, I pray that you know him. And if you don't, call on his name, just like Charles Wesley did, the Anglican pastor, the missionary, who knew he did not really know Jesus and sought and sought. And our gracious Lord responded, you know, here's one way you can kind of know if the baby has come to you, if you have received the baby. C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, imagine yourself as a living house and God comes to rebuild that house. In other words, comes to rebuild you. That's the way it works in a relationship. When you're in a living relationship with God, that's the way it works. Lewis writes, at first perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. In other words, things you ask him to help out with. You knew those jobs needed doing, so you are not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is he is building a quite different house, a different you from one that you thought about. Here, he's throwing out a new wing, putting on an extra floor, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were just gonna be repaired into a decent little cottage, but he's transforming the whole thing, building you into a new palace. Why? Because Jesus intends to live in you himself by his spirit if he's going to come to you he's going to come all in and you know he's changing you he's calling you to change and he's empowering you to change the word became flesh just like that baby and made his dwelling with us is he in you rejoice Rejoice that he has come to you. If not, call on his name, and he is gracious to respond. Hark, the herald, angels sing. The prince of peace, the one who can give us peace, has come. Let us celebrate his good news. Let us come to his table and not just receive the sacrament, but receive Jesus himself. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.